I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Eibel and Dr. Gould for inviting me here to present today at the 16th World Congress of Endoscopic Surgery. I'm gonna be talking about uh, gastric bypass for gastroparesis. These are my disclosures. Um, I'm gonna start out by reviewing the role of surgery in gastroparesis. I'm gonna go through that pretty quickly um, and then review the existing and related literature regarding gastric bypass for obesity. And finally, I'm gonna discuss the considerations when contemplating uh, performing gastric bypass for gastroparesis. So, uh, you know, not to uh, go into things in too much detail, but gastroparesis is a chronic disorder characterized by uh, delayed gastric emptying in the absence of obstruction. Um, as you've seen, the pathogenesis of gastroparesis is relatively poorly understood. Um, common symptoms that you might see are uh, nausea, vomiting, bloating, early satiety, and abdominal pain. Uh, the most common etiologies end up being uh, idiopathic, followed by uh, diabetes and post-surgical. Uh, it's diagnosed on a gastric emptying study generally with uh, greater than 10% retention at four hours. Uh, so, you know, fortunately at the University of Utah, we have Dr. Fang kind of focusing on uh, the uh, medical and nutritional symptom management ahead of time. Uh, so for mild uh, intermittent symptoms, normally dietary modification may be enough. More moderate uh, symptoms and in the absence of weight loss may utilize uh, prokinetic and antiemetic uh, medications as previously discussed. And we reserve surgery for uh, gastroparesis uh, refractory to medical management. So, you know, when you look in the literature, the role of surgery uh, for the treatment of gastroparesis is not really all that well studied or defined uh, in terms of, of when do we use it, and, and they, they tend to be small studies. Um, gastric uh, electrical stimulator and subtotal gastrectomy with Roux and Y gastrojejunostomy are common treatments for medically refractory gastroparesis. You've heard of some other therapies today, uh, other surgical therapies, including gastrostomy, jejunostomy, pyloroplasty, POP, um, and uh, what I'm gonna be talking to you about in a little bit, which is uh, Roux and Y uh, gastric bypass. So, um, you know, the most similar thing to uh, gastric bypass ends up being uh, laparoscopic subtotal gastrectomy uh, with Roux and Y gastrojejunostomy. Um, this was uh, uh, looked at in 103 patients, probably the largest study uh, in the literature. Uh, 72 patients uh, had an electrical, uh, gastric electrical stimulator implanted, and 31 patients underwent laparoscopic subtotal gastrectomy. Uh, 19 uh, patients had failure of the gastric electrical stimulator, and 13 of 19 of those patients were converted to uh, subtotal gastrectomy with 100% symptom improvement. Uh, when you compare these two groups, there was no difference in gastroparesis car in the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index. And uh, you know, based on those findings, the study concluded that laparoscopic subtotal gastrectomy should also be considered as a primary surgical treatment for gastroparesis. <clears throat> now, what about gastroparesis and obesity? Uh, well, if you look at obesity, it's a strong independent predictor of the presence of symptoms for gastroparesis. Uh, many patients with gastroparesis uh, are obese, uh, while actually few, surprisingly, are underweight. Um, gastroparesis is becoming increasingly relevant due to the current epidemics of both obesity and diabetes mellitus. Uh, and the presence of uh, the status of being overweight or, or obese is rising in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> in the setting of obesity, gastric bypass has been, pro because of these things, in the setting of obesity, gastric bypass has been proposed as a treatment modality for gastroparesis. Uh, as you might expect, this is highly uh, controversial, as is sleeve gastrectomy, so I'm not going to go there. Um, effects, and so, you know, Part of the reason it's controversial is what are the effects of uh, the residual gastric remnant? Uh, and you know, are, you are you operating on a patient with isolated gastroparesis or a patient with a global motility disorder? Because uh, if you do enough gastric bypass, you know that once you, you know, reroute the intestines, things become a lot more difficult to figure out. Um, there's been limited literature in the past five years with small patient numbers on, on the safety and efficacy of gastric bypass to treat gastroparesis. So what is that data? Um, I'm gonna kind of briefly review the, the three uh, biggest, and, and I say that uh, you know, 
uh, because they're, they're all pretty small, but the, the three studies that I was able to find in the literature on gastric bypass for gastroparesis, uh, <clears throat> these uh, span from 2014 to 2018. Uh, the first uh, is from uh, a group in Connecticut, and uh, they looked at ga uh, gastric bypass in seven obese and morbidly obese patients. And gastric bypass was performed with marked symptom improvement and significantly uh, decreased total symptom scores. Uh, zero of the four patients who were taking prokinetic agents preoperatively required them postoperatively. Uh, they also had a mean BMI uh, decrease of 9.1 kilograms per meter squared and 71.6% uh, excess, uh, percent excess body weight loss. There were no acute uh, perioperative complications, and the mean follow-up at 315, uh, mean follow-up was 315 days, ranging anywhere from about five months to two years. So based on you know, these limited findings, what they uh, concluded was that uh, gastric bypass can safely reduce gastroparesis symptoms, but that larger uh, prospective studies with longer, longer follow-up are needed. Uh, the next study uh, comes from uh, our, our previous uh, speaker, Dr. Rodriguez's group, and uh, this uh, looked at 20 patients who had gastric electrical simulator placement uh, and seven patients who underwent Ruin Y gastrojejunostomy with and without resection of the gastric remnant. Uh, one of the reasons they uh, uh, looked at just gastric bypass, so basically without resection of the gastric remnant, was to reduce potential complications from things like duodenal stump leak, and they didn't see any significant differences between those groups. Uh, but interestingly, when you look at uh, the, the GES group, uh, they had a 90% initial symptom improvement, and then later on decreasing to 55% uh, symptom improvement at a mean follow-up of 22 uh, months. Uh, Long-term follow-up showed three deaths from complications of obesity-related comorbidities, uh, which you didn't see in the ruin y gastrojejunostomy group. In those patients, uh, they had 100% uh, short-term symptom improvement, including uh, four patients that failed uh, gastric electrical stimulation. And they also had uh, five of seven patients, 71%, showing symptom improvement at a mean follow-up of 20 months. Uh, and based on those findings, uh, they recommended a strategy including laparoscopic ruin y gastrogenostomy as a first-line treatment for gastroparesis in morbidly obese patients. Uh, and this is a study uh, uh, from Dr. Rosenthal's group that was just published in February of this year, uh, which uh, looked at uh, 70 pa 78 patients who had uh, gastric electrical stimulators placed and 15 patients who underwent ruin y gastric bypass. Uh, the gastric bypass patients had, uh, uh, not surprisingly, a higher preoperative uh, mean BMI. Uh, they also had a longer operative time with a mean operative time of 180 minutes for gastric bypass. Uh, they showed no significant differences in complications, and 17 or 18 percent of the patients uh, underwent reoperation. 13 for removal or replacement of the stimulator, uh, three for uh, removal of the stimulator with conversion to gastric bypass and one patient for a small bowel obstruction following gastric bypass. <clears throat> when you looked at the outcomes of this, uh, the gastric bypass group had uh, significantly inc uh, decreased uh, incidence of nausea postoperatively, whereas the uh, gastric stimulation group had uh, significant decreases in nausea, vomiting, abdominal discomfort. This may be affected by the end, though, so if you look at uh, the decrease in nausea and vomiting and abdominal discomfort uh, for gastric bypass, there was a, a relatively reasonable uh, decrease, but I think the, the low end may have affected the, um, the significance. Uh, but the conclusions of the study were that both uh, gastric electrical stimulation and gastric bypass for refractory gastroparesis are feasible, uh, but that the use of gastric bypass remains controversial. And, just talking to some of my colleagues here at the conference, uh, it definitely is controversial. Um, so, you know, what can we take away from these three studies? Uh, I think we can take away that gastric bypass is a safe operation with a low risk of complications. That's not surprising. Uh, but it does have the potential added benefit of comorbidity resolution, some of which are associated with gastroparesis, obesity, diabetes, and 
Uh, you know, that's one thing the study from Cleveland Clinic showed was that you know, we didn't have deaths in the gastric bypass group. So um, when we're looking at, at treatments that may be safe and effective, they, we may uh, further uh, improve patients' health and the risk of gastroparesis. So uh, gastric bypass may also improve symptoms of gastroparesis with a risk profile that's not incre increased when you compare it to uh, gastric electrical stimulation. Uh, that being said, uh, if you're going to perform gastric bypass in, in someone with gastroparesis, there really needs it to be uh, proper counseling and preoperative evaluation. So uh, if you're considering this, you need to make sure that uh, medical therapies have been exhausted and set appropriate expectations. That's probably the most important thing, I think, is to talk to patients about symptom management versus symptom resolution. Uh, I'm always very careful if I'm seeing someone with a history of gastroparesis and we're offering them a procedure that we're hoping may, will make it better that their symptoms may not get better, and they, uh, but we're hoping at least for some improvement. Um, <clears throat> we want to include standard preoperative nutritional counseling and evaluation standard for any bariatric surgical patient, uh, but definitely in this group. I, uh, I think if you're doing uh, bariatric surgery, you really should be getting uh, preoperative nutritional labs on everybody at their first visit or, or before they come in so that you have some time to, um, to normalize those things and treat them. Uh, there's you know, the incidence of vitamin nutritional deficiencies is kind of rampant preoperatively, and it's going to be even greater in this patient uh, subset. And then uh, you want to optimize your patients both uh, uh, physically and nutritionally. So in summary, uh, gastroparesis is a chronic disorder with a poorly understood pathogenesis. Uh, surgery is, should really be reserved for uh, gastroparesis that's refractory to medical management. Uh, there are very few studies looking at gastric bypass and gastroparesis in obese patients, and its use remains uh, controversial. Uh, and uh, gastric bypass appears safe in the setting of re uh, refractory gastroparesis for obese patients, and it provides uh, variable degrees of symptom relief. Thank you.